Hi, today we're going to be talking about paparazzi and celebrity culture and attention and fame and how we relate to attention and fame and what this all means for mental health. The room just brightened when I said mental health. Now, I know you might be thinking, dude, you got a few subscribers. This is your third video. Do you really have to worry about paparazzi right now? And my answer to that is, you know what? You, you can never be too sure. Better to think ahead. I do actually think it's a really interesting topic, the way we relate to celebrities, and I thought it would be nice to do a little video about. I hope you enjoy. <laughs> The word paparazzi comes from a photographer character in the 1960 Fellini film La Dolce Vita, whose last name was Paparazzo. That's all well and good, that's where the word comes from, but what are they? We all know what they are. They're those independently contracted people who feed our apparently insatiable need for updates as to the well-beings of various famous people. Or do we really have that insatiable need to even know what's going on with the famous people? I can't count the times that anyone in my personal life has talked to me about celebrities or expressed to me a desire to see what a celebrity looked like leaving their house or grabbing a beverage at a cafe. But of course media outlets wouldn't be shelling out the big bucks to photographers for these photos if the photos didn't sell magazines, right? But wait a second, who even buys magazines? Like, I get that some people do, but ask yourself this. How many subscriptions do you have to magazines? If the answer is more than one, boomer. No, I get that there are plenty of good magazines, but unfortunately, my unfounded preconceptions about magazine purchasing are not so far off, given that estimated revenue of U.S. magazines fell from $46 billion to $28 billion between 2007 and 2017. And when we're reading magazines, they're not about celebrities anymore. I mean, they feature celebrities, but they're not all about celebrities, which is a bit of a difference. The fastest growing magazine brands in the U.S. are motorcyclist magazines and men's journal magazines, uh, plus whatever the fuck town and country magazines are. Looking at the list of top 10 magazines in circulation in the U.S. shows People Magazine is still the top celebrity-oriented published thing, but it's fallen to ninth by count of circulation. Readership of people has continued falling and fell over 10% in 2018 by one estimate. Why am I giving you all this information about People Fucking Magazine? To challenge the assumption that paparazzi serves a function that is necessary or desired. Cosmopolitan, the magazine, not the beverage, also dropped 10% in 2018. Overall, people are obviously just getting information from devices. So, okay, no one reads magazines anymore, and especially no one reads celebrity magazines lately either. Are we just less interested in celebrities? As nice as that might sound for ourselves, and certainly for people who may be referred to as celebrities, I don't think it's so simple as us losing interest in fame. There's a very well-done article on LitHub, I'll link in the description, about the origins of celebrity worship. That explains how explosions in literacy in the 18th and 19th century generated a broader consumer base for print publications. As the author writes, articles about celebrities, especially when illustrated with lithographs and engravings, were a reliable way to boost circulation. An 1862 issue of the Illustrated London News covering the Prince of Wales' marriage sold 930,000 copies, more than three times the magazine's usual circulation. I mean, hey, the Prince of Wales was getting married, right? I mean, that's some news, right? I gotta hear about that. Let me read that their paper, find out what's going on. Now, you can imagine how many Princes of Wales have had how many marriages since then. I'm not going to, you know, look it up and tell you. Just kidding, of course I will. There were three, if I'm not mistaken, which it was less than I was expecting. I don't know anything about the British monarchy. And I'm really happy with that. So the princes of Wales keep living, getting married, and dying. But of course, we're not only worried about people like that. 
where it used to be mostly favorite authors, then it became favorite actors and radio personalities. Because of how vast our technology of information telecommunications has grown to be, it is relatively easy and simple for anyone to be famous for anything. We have more ways to follow people, so naturally more people have gotten followed. And what is following someone but a sort of direct paparazzi? Cut out the middleman. As long as you're interested in a person you consider interesting, you'll be primed for being stimulated by what you get. As media inundates us with celebrity culture, over the last few decades, with these new, more and more modern telecommunications software and hardware and all kinds of wear, let me just put it simply, we got tired. We've been tired, okay? We got desensitized to the fact that stars are just like us. We fucking know they are. And we wish they weren't. We still need heroes just as much as we ever have, but we've been let down repeatedly by our own stupidly unrealistic expectations of people we call celebrities. Let's take one example into consideration that I think is interesting. Chance the Rapper. I love Chance the Rapper's music. I got into him late, so I mostly love Coloring Book, the album, but I fucking love that album. I was just, I was so into it. I was kind of turned on to him from a partner, and for months, Coloring Book was basically all I listened to. There's a song for every mood, and the album works as a cohesive whole extremely well while balancing such divergence within. I would go for walks outside and just listen to Coloring Book all the way through in headphones. Chance has been known for being self-published, unsigned, grassroots. I saw people talk about Coloring Book as like the third installment in the trilogy of his albums, which as the album's cover showed so well, it's him looking down. It's a success story. It's he's made it to the top. He's really done it. But it's a success story told while fully holding space for the dark stuff, like the very real grief sung on the song Same Drugs about a relationship where people have taken different paths. Or just the album's amazing opening track that's a passionate expression of overcoming no matter what. Overall, Chance always represented, in my limited understanding, a very real expression of a spiritual approach to life, taking the good with the bad, letting your ego fly a little bit, but knowing the importance of service to others and your community. I mean, he sings about giving out Apple computers for free, like convincing Steve Jobs to give out Apple computers for free. Like, that's fucking dope. Like, what a guy. And he makes amazing music. Like, there was no question. Now, let's talk about his... Newest album, The Big Day, that came out last year. It was met with a very tepid press response and, much more notably, social media world hated it. So much so that, shockingly, days after the release, Chance tweeted, I'm getting this crazy feeling that people want me to kill myself. Think about that. He wasn't suicidal, as he clarified soon after, saying, I just want to reiterate that I don't want to kill myself, nor am I ashamed of loving my wife. I think I just wanted to say out loud that I see the vibes. So Chance felt that people wanted him to kill himself with their negative response to his album. Now, this is very serious, and I know from using the internet for more than five minutes that it's very likely that a famous person like Chance was actually getting numerous comments encouraging suicide, which is so fucked up that it's genuinely hard to comprehend. But it happens. It does happen. We know that that shit happens on the internet. But, of course, Chance is famous, and he wouldn't have been talking about some psychos on the internet when he tweeted this. Like... He's clearly responding to a general consensus. He was saying that the overall response made him feel like people wanted him to kill himself. But wait a second, you may be wondering, especially if you're not so in the know about Chance the Rapper news, what was that part about loving his wife? Well, The Big Day is about Chance's wedding with partner Kirsten Corley. That was just months before the album came out. As a relatively casual fan, someone who only knew one of Chance's three huge albums before this one, I guess I was kind of surprised that he ended up with the partner who I'd gotten the impression from his songs, like, had moved on from him or something, or didn't want to be with him, but I don't know, whatever. They made it work, clearly. (laughs) 
The social media backlash was not a negative response to Chance getting married, I don't think. I'm not going to pour through Twitter to see if some people said that. But I think overall it was a negative response to what people perceived as his painful, forced positivity on this album. I mean, he's Chance. He's always been positive, spiritual, finding the good. But with lines like, Too many young angels on the south side. Got us scared to let our grandmamas outside. You know, lines like that that weren't afraid to portray the fear that many people live with in our society, you know, in our violent and imperfect world. People rejected the Big Day album, not because Chance was getting married, but because it was apparently all they felt he cared to talk about. Now, you may be asking yourself if you're nice and empathic. Well, Mr. What's Therapy Guy, what did you think of the Big Day? And here's the kicker. I haven't heard it. Haven't played a song off of it have no interest. I just haven't had an interest. Don't get me wrong. I'm not against listening to it. I just haven't had the slightest motivation to. I found it kind of fascinating and demoralizing how his entire fan base rejected his album. It was shocking. I don't think there's anything wrong with making an album about getting married to the love of your life or to anyone, really. I mean, he's an artist and can make an album or anything about what he wants to. But this album came out in late July of last year, okay? Just to give you a picture, Boris Johnson had just been elected. People were protesting in Hong Kong and were being beaten by masked gang members working for the police. See description for the article link. An arson attack had just caused one of the deadliest massacres of human life in Japan since the end of World War II. Hurricane Barry was whooping the Gulf Coast in the U.S. and over in a different Gulf, the Iranian Navy captured a British tanker and some people were worried about that. I'm just saying, there was a lot going on. I know there's always a lot going on, but there is increasingly more and more going on. And as technology and information sharing has continued to progress exponentially, we can't help knowing what's going on around us. One review said about The Big Day, Bright, flawless production supports Chance's optimistic lyrics and cultivates an atmosphere overflowing with joy, wonder, and summery nostalgia. You may be thinking, that sounds kind of nice. Why were people such jerks about it? And why won't you, Mr. Jerkman, listen to the Happy Guys album? Oh what, the celebrity didn't live up to your expectation of him being aware enough all the time of the bad in the world, so you're just going to give up your interest and ignore his work, though it comes from the same person that created brilliant art that stimulated you for months of private joy? Alright, 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 damn, fine, okay, y'all know how to get to me. Let's do this. Alright, what do we got? This is as close as I'm going to come to a reaction video. Wow, uh, so his flow was clearly great in the first song, in the beginning at least, but to call it overproduced would be a gross understatement, and I immediately saw why people were primed to hate it. His percussion is so much tighter and punchier on this first song than we've been primed for by, for instance, the genius first song of Coloring Book, which began with soft, lush trumpet fluttering, which any fan can immediately imagine when I say that. I'm not going to listen to the second song on the big day or any of the rest of them. Because guess what, people? I don't love Chance the Rapper. I loved one of his albums, and I certainly don't love or know Chancellor Jonathan Bennett, who is the 27-year-old dude. No sane person wanted Chance to kill himself or even remotely feel any pain after he released this album, or ever. He was rejected because he didn't meet the expectations that people had for him, and frankly, he only had these high expectations for him because of how complex and interesting he's been his whole career. He led us on with the beautiful and endless moods and variations of coloring book, and we didn't think that all the colors would melt into whatever clear plastic is on the Big Day's album cover. Celebrities can't be everything we want them to be because celebrities don't exist. It's a made-up category that refers to anything being celebrated. Let's celebrate ideas and good qualities instead of people. It would help us a lot in understanding ourselves. Since, though we may never be celebrated publicly, we all know what it's like to have others' expectations in us not be met. And we know that it makes us tend to pick apart ourselves and try to understand where we went wrong. So I think in understanding how we expect celebrities to fulfill us in ways they can't, we can take that lesson into other parts of our life. 
I hope this video was at least somewhat interesting to some folks, and I look forward to hearing anyone's thoughts in the comments about the paparazzi, the history of celebrity culture, or how we act towards the famous and celebrated today. Thanks for watching. Thank you.